Welcome everyone to this Transform to Net Zero event on the Supply Chain Perspective, sponsored by Unilever. I'm David Wayne, and I'll lead the climate team at BSR, an organization of sustainable business experts working with leading companies to build a just and sustainable world. My team also has the pleasure of serving as the Secretariat of Transform to Net Zero, and we're delighted that you're here. The latest science from the IPCC tells us that we are headed towards more warming than we had thought. We may well breach the Paris Agreement's stretch target of 1.5 degrees Celsius within 15 years, and its backup target of well below 2 degrees Celsius during the working lives of many of you watching today. That means that this decade, the 2020s, will therefore be the decisive decade on climate change. We are the ones who will first face severe climate impacts, not our children. The UN Climate Conference this November in Glasgow represents our next opportunity to draw down greenhouse gases. Governments, and in particular the G20 major economies, must strengthen their national climate targets to keep the Paris Agreement's goals within reach. Yet in just the last three years, over 3,000 businesses have made net zero commitments, now combined in the UN's Race to Zero campaign. This is an astonishing signal of support to governments from the business community. Commitments from businesses are good, but by themselves, they do not move the economy. What we need now is action, which transforms businesses and builds net zero value chains. Generating that transformation is why Transform to Net Zero, a small cross-sectoral group of leading companies, was created. The goal of Transform to Net Zero is for all large companies to have not just targets to achieve net zero no later than 2050, but targets backed by credible transformation plans. As any company with a credible net zero target knows, building a net zero value chain is fiendishly difficult. Companies face many challenges, from target formulation and validation, to reducing carbon intensive transport, to innovating new products and services, to deciding how to use credits en route to their net zero targets. That is why Transform to Net Zero will release a set of transformation guides beginning today to explore how its members are tackling these difficult challenges and bringing this information directly to their peers. The transformation guides will bring forward solutions to challenges faced not merely by sustainability staff at companies, but across functions and are directed at all of you from different company departments watching today. This event focuses on the challenge tackled in our first guide, how to engage suppliers to reduce upstream scope three emissions. Scope three emissions are often the largest part of a company's footprint and therefore supplier engagement will be key to meeting the Paris goals. We are incredibly lucky, therefore, to have three supply chain leaders from Transform to Net Zero members with us today who are tackling this challenge in very different supply chains. They are Dave Ingram, Chief Procurement Officer at Unilever, Maureen Graham, VP of Responsible Sourcing and Manufacturing at Nike, and Cheryl Holliday, Senior Director of Procurement Compliance at Microsoft. Before we explore solutions with them, we'll begin with a video clip from Head of Decarbonization, Morten Bo Christensen, with fellow Transform to Net Zero member, Maersk, a supplier of transport that is advancing decarbonized solutions at scale. In 2018, here at Maersk, we made the pledge to become carbon neutral for our fleet by 2050. We did it because it's our obligation and because more and more large customers were developing net zero strategies for their supply chains. And these customers looked to us to help them. So back then in our company and across the global shipping community, we did not know the specifics of how to achieve this. So that ambition was more of a call to action to challenge ourselves. And not least our ecosystem, because it was very clear from the get-go that we need innovation, we need collaboration across the entire shipping value chain to solve this problem. Today we have realized that decarbonization is a strategic imperative for our business. And therefore we want to accelerate our original ambition. We also want to seek accountability for the entire supply chain. So not just shipping, 
more than half of our top 200 customers, household brands like Unilever, like Nike, like Microsoft, our fellow members of the Transform to Net Zero initiative, whom you will hear from later today, have made or they are in the process of creating science-based targets for their supply chains. Here at Maersk, we are front runners in efficiency measures and we know that efficiency will play a big part, but we also know that efficiency in itself can never get us to zero. Getting to zero will require a shift away from the fossil fuels of today towards green fuels of tomorrow. It needs to happen across the entire global supply chain. And to meet these demands and to get the prices of these green fuels down, huge scale is needed. And once we took that new perspective, we quickly saw that for shipping the hard to abate tag is in fact more of a chicken and egg problem. The situation was a bit that if there is no carbon neutral fuel market, well, that, that's because there's no carbon neutral vessels to create a demand. And on the other hand, no one wanted to build a carbon neutral vessel since there was no fuel to propel it. And that really inspired us to lean in and make the move to kickstart things, to move past this chicken and egg situation. We did that to exercise constant care and ensure that we remain relevant to our customers, which are more than 80,000. We want to remain relevant to them in the decades to come. So in February, we announced the world's first container vessel capable of running on green methanol. Small vessel, a feeder, to gain operational experience, a pilot, if you will. Camp June, we managed to actually secure enough supply of green methanol, so-called e-methanol, to run this vessel. But the real game changer really came when in August we announced eight large vessels operating on green methanol. These eight vessels will burn around somewhere between three and 400,000 tons of green methanol every year. And when they do that, they will displace a million tons of CO2. That's around 3% of our emissions. And these ships are really changing the conversation we have with our customers. Now it's not about a pilot. It's really about discussing a truly scalable carbon neutral product. These vessels also change the conversation we have with suppliers. Developers across the world, they now come to us to discuss real offtake agreements. So timelines, volumes, prices. And that dialogue again changes the conversation that they have with the investors they need to get the funding for their projects. We still have to see if the snowball effect that we need in shipping will come in time, but at least the ball is rolling now. And this is not least due to the powering companies like Microsoft, Nike, Unilever, who are taking action together with partners in fighting climate change. Thank you. Dave Marine Shera. Morton spoke about Maersk kickstarting the transformation needed to build net zero value chains and solving the chicken egg problem between buyers and suppliers. It's clearly that relationship between buyer and supplier, which is critical in tackling upstream emissions. He also spoke about the importance of fellow transformed to net zero members like you, Unilever, Nike, and Microsoft in solving the problem. Maersk is kickstarting transformation with eight new vessels which will save a million tons of carbon a year. Now let's turn to what you are doing to kickstart transformation as buyers. Dave, I'd like to start with you. This May, Unilever put its Climate Transition Action Plan to shareholders at your annual general meeting and secured overwhelming approval by over 99% of shareholders. Your plan includes a net zero target by 2039, which includes your upstream emissions. Unilever has a long, a decade-long history of working on supplier sustainability for particular agricultural commodities. But how will your supplier engagement evolve as you move forward with implementing your net zero goal? Hey, thanks, David. And let me start by saying how proud we are to be working with Maersk um, and how pleased we are to see their latest announcement in August. Uh, huge investment, but huge benefit to the world, a million tons saving of carbon. Um, it's working with people like Maersk for us, which is really a priority in the future, helping us to achieve our goals uh, with companies that share the same values as us. 
Supplier engagement across all of our climate and nature goals is crucial, really, really important. We're not going to achieve our goals without them. We've got around 55,000 partners on our ecosystem, but really 450 of them are absolutely critical to delivering both our growth, our resilience, and realizing our sustainable business ambition um, and their commitments. Climate change and the de de devastation it's causing absolutely matters to us and our business, and importantly, our consumers. Unchecked, it's going to threaten our whole value chain, and we're not alone in the impact or the solutions. The minimum impacts we're already seeing are chronic and acute water stress, reducing agricultural productivity. We're seeing that in the last nine months in key crops around the world, raising raw material food prices and dramatically affecting availability of our own raw materials for our products. The increased frequency of extreme weather, whether it be storms or floods, is causing increased disruption across our chain. Being able to supply our, into our manufacturing or our third party manufacturing facilities, operating our distribution networks. We know that temperature increases and extreme, these extreme weather events are reducing economic activity, and hence our sales levels are falling in some of these sectors. So taking decisive action to help address climate change is not only important for people and the planet, it's really important for us as a business. So through our climate promise, Unilever is inviting our supply partners to demonstrate their shared values and commitment to working with us to measure, reduce and report emissions in their own value chains. And we are looking forward to incentivizing and supporting their success in that. This promise, whilst entirely optional, presents an opportunity for our supplier partners to position themselves on the leading edge of our planet commitments and to demonstrate that addressing the environmental footprint of our value chains is of paramount importance. By signing the Unilever Climate Promise, our supply partners promise to A, set a public climate target uh, to have absolute greenhouse gases by 2030, B, publicly report progress towards meeting that target, and lastly, sharing greenhouse gas emissions, their footprint data with us. Additionally, we'll be launching the Unilever Climate Programme with a subset of 300 of our suppliers who represent quite a meaningful proportion of our upstream scope three emissions. That's a very exciting development, Dave. And when it comes time, uh, BSR would be pleased to make the climate promise. I want to speak a bit more about the climate program. You've indicated that you're, you will focus on a smaller number of your 56,000 suppliers for the climate program. How did you choose who to start with? Yeah, look, our raw materials, including a third party manufactured product, account for about 60% of our value chain emissions. Uh, so they therefore become a primary focus of our overall emissions reductions efforts uh, over the next 10 years. We buy these materials from a large ecosystem, as I mentioned, of very diverse suppliers around the world. But to be effective, um, we know we can engage with 55,000 partners and we need to focus and focus on those that have the biggest impact for us. So our first task was to identify which materials and which suppliers we should work with in that initial priority. So a team within our uh, procurement function began to identify which materials contribute the most to our overall greenhouse gas footprint. We also investigated where in the value chain most greenhouse emissions arise by material type. And lastly, we integrated which of our suppliers we need to work with to mitigate these value chain emissions from those value chains. The result of the segmentation and prioritization was that we were able to identify the top 300 suppliers out of our total ecosystem of about 55,000 with whom we should work with to have real impact in the short term. So with those 300 suppliers, um, we'll get about two thirds of our upstream footprint covered. As I said, they represent a wide diversity of sectors, geographies across our chemicals, food and beverage, paper and pulp, and agribusiness portfolios. So the Unilever Climate Programme will be launched in three phases over the next three to five years. Uh, we'll kick things off this year with a subset of these suppliers who can help us shape the programme, uh, help us 
uh, help to help them and to help the further 300 identified suppliers beyond 2023. What are you partnering with these initial suppliers to do as you move forward with phase one of the climate program? And how will you partner with them to do this? So yeah, within those focused suppliers I mentioned, uh, we've detected a range of climate capabilities. A handful of them have set already themselves stretching climate targets that aligns with what science says is needed and they're well on their way to achieving them. Uh, others have not yet begun uh, on that journey. So through the program we're developing, we'll be offering support to those that need it to help them fast track the lessons we and others have learned over the past decade for effective climate action. So the support, given the range of capabilities in that base, will not be a one size fits all approach. Rather, we'll aim to meet the suppliers where they are. I tailor our agreement engagement with them based on where they are and what their immediate plans are. Ultimately, however, we want all of these suppliers to set and achieve the emissions targets needed uh, in the required time frame. And this will require you to develop a program and procurement processes that drive that action. Thanks so much, Dave. I want to turn to Maureen now. Maureen, last year in the midst of the pandemic, Nike launched a new climate effort with strategic suppliers to reduce their emissions. How are you extending your strong relationship with these suppliers into climate? And what has their response been like? Thanks, David, and great to be here. Let me start first with a bit of context on our, our source base. So we work with approximately 500 contract factories across 40 countries that employ over a million workers. And we've learned through decades of experience with them that we're better able to drive progress and change in the regions we work with by engaging closely with not only our suppliers, but also governments, NGOs, and other stakeholders to improve local industry and, and help protect workers. And because of these strong long-term relationships we formed with our suppliers, some over the past 30 to 40 years, we're able to work together to affect real change. We're building on the success of decades of engagement on various sustainability initiatives across labor, health and safety, and environment. For example, such as collaborating with our suppliers to find better alternatives for production methods and energy sourcing. The goal is really for our suppliers to take on a leadership role around sustainability issues. In order to accelerate that work, this past year we launched the Supplier Sustainability Council, or SSC, with leadership from 10 of our largest footwear and apparel partners. And together, these partners account for over half of our production volume. The SSC creates an opportunity for our sourcing partners to drive sustainability from within their own companies to enhance operational performance, mitigate risk, and drive collective action. Because we know that the faster we can collectively do more for the planet, the better it will be for generations to come. While overall the SSC is focused on advancing a number of sustainable development goals, we found in conversations with our suppliers that climate change is among the top concerns raised by all members with a focus on some of the risks that Dave actually already called out, rising energy costs, the impact of increasing temperatures on working conditions, increasing intensity and frequency of extreme weather events, and upcoming government regulations and carbon taxes. To help those manufacturing partners within the SSC engage more assertively and urgently in the climate space, we created the Supplier Climate Action Program, which I'll refer to as ESCAP, in May of last year with the help of trusted partners like the World Resources Institute, the leader in GHG emissions inventories and CDP, the leading climate disclosure platform. Maureen, I imagine that as for Unilever, decarbonization poses highly technical and sometimes scary implications for your strategic suppliers. How are you helping them through those implications? It does. and. And really, SCAP is, is focused on encouraging our suppliers to address climate change strategically through developing their own long term climate mitigation plans, while also aligning with Nike's science based targets for 2030. And SCAP really builds on the decades long supplier partnerships I mentioned earlier. In the climate and energy space, we've already built significant capacity with our partners on energy management best practices, five year target setting and energy and emissions reporting, which they do monthly directly to Nike. So we already know our suppliers footprint 
And we were able to quickly identify those partners that would have the biggest impact by reducing emissions. The program provides suppliers with the management tools they need to set and achieve ambitious climate targets and requires suppliers to conduct corporate GHG inventory, set scope one and two emissions reductions in line with science, disclose through CDP and consider climate risk and opportunities. So through SCAP, we're not only providing technical assistance to our suppliers to help set more ambitious climate goals, but the whole program turns the process of achieving our extended supply chain emissions reductions into an aligned strategic effort. Marina, and how is the impact so far? What has the uptake been? And have, has this program already been able to deliver some results? Well, I think that's the most exciting part. Um, our SSC partners have, have committed already to ambitious reductions across their entire scope one and two emission footprint for not only their Nike related emissions, but their entire footwear and apparel businesses. And that translates to a projected 42% cut in baseline emissions over 10 years, which as I mentioned, will help Nike better achieve our goals. For scope three, we've set a 30% reduction by 2030. And these suppliers that account for more than 60% of our manufacturing emissions will go a long way towards driving progress towards achievement of our own enterprise science-based target. That translates to roughly a carbon equivalent of um, taking 300,000 passenger vehicles off the road for a year. At its heart, the program is really supporting the deepest parts of our supply chain to take climate, climate action, which we hope creates ripple effects for the industry. This is the level of emissions reduction that is needed collectively across the globe to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. And I'll add that this program is distinct because it allows suppliers to expand their skill set to include long term strategic planning on climate issues, which by their very nature require long term planning and innovative solutions. So while developing a long range climate plan is new territory for suppliers, we're working with our SCAP members to develop a shared plan and use that as a roadmap to reduce the barriers, whether financial, technical or otherwise, needed to get us and the industry at large to our ambition of net zero by 2050. That strategic planning will happen over the coming months. And one of the most exciting pieces of this program is this joint climate action plan that we're gonna create with our suppliers that will serve as a roadmap for emissions reduction over the next 10 years and help drive further action toward our, our shared climate ambition. It's wonderful to hear, Marie, and especially that um, that in, you're not only tackling your own visual scope your footprint, but in fact changing many large suppliers in the footwear and apparel industry. Um, I want to turn to Shara. Dave mentioned that Unilever's the climate program meet suppliers where they are. I think this is one of the key themes of Microsoft's action too. Can you give us some examples about how you are meeting suppliers where they are? Yes, and thank you, David. And thanks for being here as well. Um, honestly, it's about listening uh, to truly understand where our suppliers were in their sustainability journey. We invested a great deal of time with them. Last year, we completed maturity assessments targeting roughly 200 of our largest indirect suppliers. And when I say indirect, I mean suppliers who provide services to Microsoft, from facilities build out to digital marketing, to product testing and support. These suppliers accounted for the majority of indirect emissions. And this year, we will assess approximately 200 more suppliers. So we spent time listening, which gave us the ability to develop targeted education resources and webinars to support our suppliers through emission disclosure and reduction planning. Specifically, we were able to address the top piece of feedback from our suppliers, a need for comprehensive carbon accounting resources. And we released those publicly in July through the Microsoft.com Sustainability Tools and Resources webpage. Throughout our sustainability journey, transparency has, has been paramount to us. And whenever possible, we make our resources and our learnings freely available to others. Another great example is our carbon removal request for proposal white paper. And that can be also be found in Microsoft's uh, Climate Pledge progress report from this January. Thanks, Shara. I, I have read the carbon removal right white paper and certainly others should too. Um, so you obviously are getting a deep understanding of where your suppliers are. Can I ask, after you have that understanding, what kinds of tools will you use to incentivize their decarbonization? Yes, yeah, so I think similar 
to both Unilever and Nike, you know, we, we know our greatest impact comes when we work together with shared values and goals for people and planet. Uh, so we've done a few things. Um, in July of 2020, we updated our supplier code of conduct. And that is a code that outlines our expectations for our Microsoft suppliers. You know, we require now suppliers to disclose their scope one, two, and three emissions and develop a plan to reduce those emissions. As much as we wanted to share that ambition and expectation with them, we also wanted to take this opportunity to listen and learn from them on this journey. Um, so we can learn from each other because we are in this together. Uh, this approach allowed us to understand resources, roadblocks to address, and then best practices that we could leverage from each other. Internally, we are piloting adjustments to our sourcing process specifically our request for proposal templates and scorecards. And we expanded our internal carbon fee that previously covered scope one and two to cover scope three emissions for each business unit within Microsoft. When Microsoft buyers make decisions, they no longer are looking at just capabilities and cost. They are now considering how the work will impact the carbon footprint of their business unit. Supplier success in decarbonization will impact internal buying decisions uh, for years to come. Sure, these are certainly a new set of requirements that your suppliers will have to meet. What about those suppliers who lack the financial resource to engage in decarbonization? How might you help them? Sure, I mean, we recognize it takes resources and capital to make meaningful decarbonization progress. And not every company has access to such capital. At Microsoft, we focused on suppliers who have large amounts to spend with us because as big companies, we collectively have the biggest carbon footprints and thus should be leading the effort to decarbonize. Through our listening sessions and in response to some of our supply chain needing financial resources to decarbonize, we announced a partnership with the Internal Finance Corporation known as IFC which is a sister organization of the World Bank, in July of this year to identify technical solutions and financing opportunities in emerging markets. The initial advisory cost is covered by Microsoft and suppliers have the opportunity to take advantage of below market rate loans and advisory services. Although this program is currently in pilot stage, we have intention to scale the program offering to our suppliers' suppliers to further aid in our supply chain's ability to decarbonize. That is super exciting. Well, look, these are really tremendous developments from all three companies. I want to say, because Transform to Net Zero and you are Transform to Net Zero members means to galvanize transformation at all large companies, your counterparts at these companies must undertake the same journey that you are undertaking. And so I, I want to ask all of you, what advice you might have for these counterparts, supply chain leader to supply chain leader? And happy for any of you to jump in. Let me jump in. Then. I, look, I think there's three things um, from our perspective. First is to integrate it with the business strategy, um, ensuring that senior management uh, and the government systems are in place and really that it's not a Friday afternoon job. Uh, doing the same thing then with your supplier strategy. So it's not an add-on to uh, financial contracting management, it's fundamental to it. Uh, and it's also fundamental to your choice of supply base. And lastly, that is the, the change is based on data. There's a lot of noise um, and false uh, information uh, around. So basing things on science-based uh, targets is going to be critical for all of us. So those are the three key things for me. Superstar. I completely Maria, agree. Sure. Yeah, Dave, great points on integration and obviously the, the use of data and science to back up a lot of the work. I think one thing I would add is don't be afraid to start somewhere. Um, you know, we all share face dilemmas. Our entire industry has to transform how it uses energy and what types of energy we use. And really to achieve the level of transformation that we need we have to, to do it together. And collaboration on these issues really transcends competition. Um, if I look at how we set our science-based targets, we underwent an intensive two-year collaborative process to develop them 
um, back in 2017 and convened an industry working group, including, as I mentioned earlier, the World Resources Institute, other brands, um, to really set the sectoral guidance for science-based targets for our industry. So don't be afraid to ask for help. There's a lot of resources out there. I would encourage those of you starting out to rely on experts, partners, and again, data to, to help determine your greatest areas of impact and, uh, and just get started. Absolutely. And I think for us, it's just, you know, having a very clear tone from the top. You know, businesses, they really need to acknowledge that supply chain, a scope through emissions are a significant part of the landscape. And that we do, um, like Maureen said, just need to work together um, and also participate in something bigger than yourselves, <laughs> like transformed to net zero. You know, we really should be working together to make it easy as possible for our shared suppliers uh, to make meaningful progress. I want to ask all of you then, so some of your counterparts, they might think they're not like you, and it's really, it's really too hard for them. But maybe their supply chain doesn't concentrate emissions the way that yours does, or maybe their supply chain involves thousands of SMEs, or maybe that they lack the leverage over their tier one suppliers that you have. I want to ask you, what do you say to them? You know, I can go, uh, David, I, you know, I would just say, don't underestimate the power of the customer voice and a cumulative voice that's asking for change. It really is more powerful than one customer asking alone. Um, and what we found is your ask can often be the catalyst to unlock leadership support on this topic that individuals and even dedicated supplier sustainability teams have been working to achieve for, for some time. So uh, use your voice. Maureen, shall we go to you? Because you seem to have your hand almost up. Sure. I, I think for me, it really comes down to the business case for suppliers and really the concept of, of partnership and creating mutual value, which I think many of us share here today. At the end of the day, the business case for setting SBTs is the same for any company trying to set themselves up for long-term success. You know, lower carbon businesses can save costs through efficiency measures and by investing in cost competitive solutions like on-site solar. And they're more likely to be climate resilient um, by planning for climate related disruptions and implementing mitigation plans um, through climate risk work. So by thinking about innovative solutions to climate now, they'll be better positioned against competitors who will be competing for business from brands um, who over time are expecting them to become more and more environmentally conscious uh, in their sourcing decisions. So it's really a matter of, uh, again, creating mutual value with, with your extended supply chain. Net zero targets. They have come under some criticism lately, and some in the audience might think that companies working with their suppliers are not serious about impact. I think we can all agree, everyone in the audience, that we need transformative net zero implementation to meet these goals. I want to ask the three of you how your companies are leveraging collaboration, trust building, and partnership to successfully bring your suppliers along on this journey. I mean, collaboration is the core of how we're going to get it done. And we know we can't do this alone. Um, I would say that a problem as large and complex as climate change requires collaboration across our entire industry and even cross sector, including among our peers and competitors. Um, and with those outside our industry, we're able to do, you know, through engagements like these with the Transform to Net Zero Alliance. Um, when it comes to our suppliers, we I think as, as many have mentioned today, work with those who share our values and our commitment to making products responsibly and sustainably. And through building long-term relationships with those suppliers, uh, with programs like our Supplier Climate Action Program, we not only transform those relationships, but also help our suppliers form strong relationships with others that in turn create um, a bit of a, a windmill effect for them to, to create impact. On the topic of impact, I'll go back to Nike's science-based targets, which help us determine impact. For our scope three targets, we've set a target of 30% reduction by 2030. And through our work with our suppliers, 
um, where they've committed to ambitious reductions across their entire scope one and two emission footprint, that helps us achieve our scope three target. Um, again, with that 42% cut in baseline emissions over 10 years. So this level of emissions reduction creates real impact, um, helping all of us reach the type of emissions reduction that we need to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. Did you share anything you'd like to add? Yeah, look, I think um, putting a different perspective on it, um, a lot of it for us starts internally. Uh, we want to make sure our own people, our own community, our own buyers understand um, and are excited by the ambition because ultimately they're the people that are going to be sitting across the table and uh, or in the field with our suppliers. So it starts there in terms of education and excitement and, and belief. Um, I think there's an incredible challenge about the how clear and simple the communication is or how complex it could be on the other side. So making sure that we clarify and give focused, clear messages to our supply base. And therein lies a problem because much of our supply base will be getting communication from a number of different companies. So we do want to advocate for some form of, you know, more consistent um, languaging and more consistent uh, road mapping and targeting and support systems, which I think will help us all get to where we want to get to faster. Super. Yeah, and I would just, and I completely agree. It's it's not only all the buyers, but the suppliers, and all of us to come together um, to do something greater than we honestly could do alone. Um, I would also say, you know, it's in our nature to just truly listen. Um, and in order to collaborate, you need to understand where people are. Um, and I think that's been a theme throughout this discussion of meeting suppliers or buyers where they are. Um, and so we are in this together. Um, we see suppliers and their commitment, and they see our commitment to a joint journey with them based on some of the investments and resources that we're making available. Um, and our hope is really, you know, to inspire our suppliers to flip the switch of, you know, being simply a participant in our effort and our collective climate effort um, to a champion of this effort. It's very true. Uh, my last question for you has to do with a crystal ball. So the rise of company net zero commitments from zero to 3,000 has taken less than three years. If we at BSR pull out our crystal ball, we think these commitments are going to accelerate, not slow down in the coming years. This is here with us to stay. All eyes now happen to be on what governments, businesses, and others will deliver at COP26 in November. But if we look ahead, the next major COP, I suppose that would now be COP30, um, will be in 2025. And I wanna ask where you think supply chain engagement progress will be in four years time when that next major milestone arrives. Um, I could start, David. Um, I think for us, uh, you know, we hope to see transformation across sectors. Um, and as a procurement leader, I wanna know that our supplier code of conduct and our engagements with our suppliers are playing a role in driving those transformations. Um, that means improved reporting across the supply base, to have a more realistic view of emissions, understanding what interventions are working or not, seeing a greater availability of alternate fuels and electrification that are important in logistics, a mass renewable electrification covering many of our suppliers as well, and then being able to track all these things uh, to make procurement decisions based on cost and sustainability get those markets moving. That is our hope. Rain or Dave, your crystal ball. Yeah, from my side, I, I, I think that there, there's going to be a world that has a radical transparency and radical traceability and that consumers will have immediate access to their impacts through choices and products they make and will ultimately know whether they're doing good 
are not good by the choices they make on everyday consumer goods. Um, and so data coming up and down these chains is going to have to ultimately get unpacked. Um, I, and I think that's a really, really positive thing. Super, Marine, it's up to you. Would you like the last word before we get to the quick Q&A? I love that concept of radical transparency and traceability. I hope we're there in four years. Um, I think from our end, you know, we're planning to expand our program to even more suppliers within our extended supply chain. Uh, so in four years time, I hope we're seeing the, the results of that joint action. Um, but, you know, there are a couple of roadblocks along the way to that we need to unlock as well, including, for example, you know, renewable energy in, in a lot of our um, source based countries and changing the grids there. So I hope that in four years we're seeing some of the results of um, some of that policy advocacy as well um, and protecting the, the future of this beautiful planet and, and the future of sport for all of us. Thanks so much, Rene. It's another good reason why COP26 has to deliver, actually, in November. Um, let's turn now to some questions um, from our audience. Uh, Shara, um, could you describe a bit more in detail how you chose suppliers to work with in practice? What criteria did you use to choose them, and how did you assess their maturity? Sure. Thanks, David. Microsoft contracts with thousands of suppliers in the indirect space. And to focus our time on those creating the greatest progress on carbon emissions reductions, we are engaging with only a subset of this indirect supply base. Realistically, that is where we should focus. And we're focused on those that comprise our top tiers of spend and equate to approximately 80% of our indirect supplier emissions. These suppliers are now required to disclose and reduce their emissions. With regards to assessing supplier maturity, we asked them to complete a brief maturity assessment on topics including their company's sustainability goals, current initiatives, governance, and external engagement. We then plotted the data against their impact on our overall missions to group them into quadrants so that we could drive targeted actions and next steps. For example, for suppliers who have a significant impact on our missions and are very mature in their sustainability efforts, we partner with these suppliers to pilot new reduction program offerings or identify areas where we can mutually build solutions together for the industry. And for suppliers who have a significant impact on our emissions but are just starting out on their journey, we're spending time with these suppliers to better understand the support and resources they need so we can better assist them in their disclosure and reduction efforts. You know, we cannot and should not do this alone. We are in this together and we strongly believe that the vast supplier network that we have can create a positive ripple effect to reduce carbon emissions. Thanks so much, Shara. Two more for you. Um, Microsoft is well known for having an internal carbon price. I think if I were using precise terminology, internally it is not a shadow price, I would say a carbon fee. Um, mm -hmm. I wanna ask how are you piloting the use of that price to, influencing, to influence purchasing decisions? You're correct. Uh, Microsoft does have an internal carbon fee in place um, and has had uh, a fee in place for scopes one and two since 2012. In 2020, we expanded the fee to also cover scope three emissions. Our fee is paid by each division in our business based on its carbon emissions, and the funds are used to pay for sustainability improvements and investments. In January 2021, Microsoft released its inaugural uh, environmental sustainability report, a key learning that our president and vice chair Brad Smith cited was the need to integrate a carbon price into the company's contracts. He stated, contracts today do not include a price on carbon or the cost of getting and keeping carbon out of the atmosphere, and they must. In order to pilot integrating a carbon price into our contracts, we will take advantage of the company's existing carbon fee model. Specifically, we will highlight the anticipated carbon fee associated with supplier bids as a quantitative decision point during the RFP evaluation process. This carbon cost will be presented to the business owner alongside the cost of the actual project work as an additional decision factor. The intent of servicing the carbon, surfacing the carbon fee is to start changing business behavior by changing our business practices. By one, incentivizing the business owner to choose a greener supplier, and two, demonstrate to our suppliers that their emission reduction efforts are a meaningful decision factor in awarding business. 
We're really excited to pilot this work and help to wrap up the pilot by the close of the calendar year. And when we complete, we will look to publish a white paper on what we learned. Super, Shara. Lots of thumbs up for the, from the audience there. Um, a third question over to you is, um, of course, IRP and sustainability, you are a supply chain leader. Um, how did you train your supply chain and procurement staff on climate and sustainability? How did you build up that knowledge base in that different function? Sure. Well, before any training, we invested in building a team that was fully dedicated and responsible for leading the sustainability work. We had a small number of in-house experts and also hired industry expertise. We coupled these individuals with employees who have strong operational and supplier management backgrounds and a true passion for the work. <laughs> these individuals are learning on the job from each other through industry participation and self-study. And now that core team is responsible for developing and leading the training and readiness efforts across our full global procurement organization. Additionally, Microsoft introduced an internal sustainability in action badge, which is essentially an in internal training on sustainability to give all Microsoft employees the opportunity to master fundamental sustainability concepts like carbon negativity, circularity, and water intensity. Those who earn the sustainability and action badge demonstrate their understanding of these concepts, how Microsoft puts these concepts into practice, and how every employee can make sustainability a part of their work and their life. Super, really essential to business transformation. I'm gonna to turn to Maureen now. Um, there are some questions for you as well. Um, you've spoken about the importance of relationships to drive collective action. Can you share more insight about how this works in practice within the SEC and the SCAP? Sure, thanks, David. So as I mentioned earlier, the work that we've been doing really builds on long-term partnerships that we've been fostering with suppliers for many decades now. So we have a strong foundation of meeting regularly, um, and openly addressing challenges with partners. In practice for the Supplier Sustainability Council, that means C-level engagement from both our suppliers and Nike on a biannual basis and much more frequent touch points for the working teams, for example, that are implementing SCAP. And as we continue to deepen those relationships, um, we really focus on the business case for suppliers and on creating mutual value, increasing resilience and ensuring business continuity in all the work that we do. Thanks, Maureen. One more over to you. Um, what role does participating in cross-sector collaborations like Transform to Net Zero play in your overall sustainability strategy? One audience member has asked whether leading brands might sh which share suppliers might be able to interact to more efficiently target their efforts. Yeah, that's a great question. We at Nike acknowledge that our, we're in a very unique position, I think, to drive change given our, our global scale. And that's the exciting piece where really small changes can lead to, to big impacts. And we know that as a, a problem as large and, and complex as climate change really requires relentless collaboration across the industry, including our, our peers and competitors. So we've made cross-sector partnerships and, and pre-competitive collaboration a huge piece of how we, we drive that systemic change. Um, while we can be impactful by ourselves, we know that we can have outsized impact acting with others. So that's exactly why we joined Transform to Net Zero to collaborate with those outside of our immediate industries of fashion and sport. And inside our own industry, we're also working with partners like the UN's Fashion Industry Charter for Climate Action, the Fashion Pact, Sustainable Apparel Coalition, et cetera. And for example, as you note in the question, the footwear and apparel industry uh, does have a number of shared suppliers. We frequently work pre-competitively with other brands across a number of topics in the spirit of making progress faster, for example, in the common assessment and, and joint remediation space. Thanks so much, Rain. Pre-competitive collaboration, definitely essential to net zero value chains also. Um, Dave, uh, some questions for you. Um, is participation in the climate promise and the climate program optional or required for suppliers? And will you treat those who participate differently from other suppliers? Yeah, look, uh, we've said that um, commitment to the promise isn't compulsory, but obviously we really want people to be joining us in the journey. Uh, we think it's an important journey. We think it's essential for not just Unilever, but for the world. So we're very keen to engage, to help people understand the journey, to understand where they are on that journey and to help work with them. I would imagine that over time, as we look at all of our commitments, whether it's climate, nature, or social, that 
will increasingly direct our procurement to businesses who are very aligned to those similar missions. Um, but at this stage, we are about engaging and bringing arms out to people rather than eliminating people from our supply chain. Thanks, Dave. Um, another question, a bit more practical, technical. What are the kinds of questions you ask or will ask your suppliers to identify and measure their carbon footprint? And how will you persuade them to change their work style to be climate friendly? Yeah, so a range of things. Um, you, you've heard me say earlier that we're really focusing our attention on 300 core suppliers who we know are essential to our journey. They, they constitute about 80% of our scope three. And we'll, and we'll do that within three phases. We're focused right now on 50 companies. And we'll ask lots of questions like, you know, where are they? What's the level of understanding? Have they set targets? Are those targets science-based? Um, are they going to public, publicly report their information? Are they willing to share their information with Unilever uh, so that we can better understand for ourselves the climate impact of our products? So a range of things covering essentially you know, their own learning, education, understanding alongside their science-based um, assessment analysis and finally reporting mechanisms, whether it be public or with Unilever itself. Thanks, Dave. One more question to um, all of you. Um, the initiatives you have shared today with the audience clearly take time, effort, and resource to develop. Is your investment of this resource, is it delivering wins for you and your suppliers? It's entirely up to you. Who would like to go first? I look happy to jump in. Um, a, we're not measuring the win in the short scale, in the short term. Um, a, th this is for us about a long term commitment. It's about changing the impact of our company and our suppliers on the world. Um, we realize that's going to take time. Um, we have an aggressive target at 2039 for ourselves, um, but working with these large industries is going to take some time. I, I think the win for the planet is clear. That's, that's uh, very obvious. Uh, and I do think, I think I said earlier, that consumers are increasingly asking for this information, whether it's our climatic impact or our social impact. They're increasingly wanting to know what is the footprint, what is their personal footprint by buying one of our products or using one of our products. So I do believe that we'll see wins in terms of consumer preference uh, very soon, um, if not already, on some of these aspects. Thanks, Dave. Chair Maureen, it's up to you. Anything you want to add to this final question? I completely agree with Dave. We right now are setting the foundation. We also have a bold 10-year commitment uh, to be carbon negative by 2030. It will take time. Uh, we will learn along the journey. And we also believe that it not only makes sense for humankind, but it makes solid business sense to do this together. Thanks so much. I completely agree. I think very well said, both Dave and Shara. I think that it's really less for us about getting there at a specific date. I think we've all set ambitious 2030 goals, but for me, it's more about whether any of us will still be relevant if we don't. Well, let me thank all three of you. And I want to say to the audience, today you've seen three leaders from three leading companies in completely different sectors with very different supply chains speak to how they will engage suppliers to reduce upstream scope three emissions. It is a daunting challenge, but not one which deters them. And for you, those of you with a net zero target, it will be an inescapable challenge. They are taking somewhat different approaches based on their particular supply chain, and they are a wonderful menu of leading by example. Yet there are commonalities across their approaches. 
The work of all three aims not merely to reduce their own scope three emissions, their own slice of the value chain, but to drive towards net zero across the full value chain. They are all making use of trusted relationships with their suppliers. All three are in their different ways, maximizing the impact of their supplier engagement. They have had to assess and prioritize their suppliers to do so. And they've all had to determine which tools, educational, co-creation, advisory, and financial are best suited to landing that impact. Let me thank these leaders and encourage you to read the Transform to Net Zero Transformation Guide released today as you begin your own journey. The 10 Transform to Net Zero members will return in subsequent guides to tackle the other hardest challenges in net zero implementation. The next challenges up will be net zero goal setting and internal validation, innovating net zero products and services, effective policy engagement, and customer engagement.